Glory to the Father, and the Son of the Ghost. Amen. In the octave of this great feast of Easter, the greatest of all the feasts, the greatest day of the completion of the victory of the crucifixion. And one of the mysteries of this feast, always considered all my life, is why in the hearts and minds of most people, this is not the greatest day. Everyone loves Christmas, a little baby born in Bethlehem, but Easter somehow passes us by. And why is it? There's something about Easter, and it's spoken of in the epistle today, and spoken of also in the gospel. There's something about this Easter. One should think that Easter would be the greatest day in our hearts, in the hearts of all Catholics, in the hearts of all those who have any hope of salvation. But this would be the greatest day, and Holy Week, the greatest week. And yet, somehow, it's not that way. And why is it? And today, a few considerations on this mystery of the sacredness of Easter. And it is said by St. Peter in the epistle. It says, Our Lord, there's, some, there's several things about Easter that concern us. One of them is that when the baby is born, all of us can rejoice. A little innocent child is born. Everyone is happy at the sight of a child, except for the most wicked, such as Herod who decrees the death of the child. But he is exceptionally wicked. He is even more wicked than the average wicked man. But all those who have any heart, all those that have any humanity in them, rejoice at the child being born. The king has come. But something about Easter causes us to be concerned. There's something about Easter that we don't rejoice in the same way. And that's because the rejoicing of Easter is not for everyone. One reason is that Easter is the resurrection. The resurrection of what? The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was killed by my sins. If I was not a sinner, he would not have had to rise, because he would not have been killed. And so when we see the resurrected Christ, there's a kind of guilt. We see Christ risen from the dead, and we know that we're happy that he rose, but how did he die? What brought about his death? I brought about his death. And there's something convicting about his resurrection. And that's what St. Peter says in the epistle today. This Jesus, and then another passage also, the same kind of thing, whom you crucified, he is the one that rose from the dead. Who is this Jesus Christ? He is the one that you crucified. He is the one that we all crucified, that I crucified, that all of us crucified. And so the sight of the resurrected Christ reminds us of some personal guilt. And so there's something uncomfortable about it. And since every man except for the Blessed Virgin Mary is guilty, there's an uncomfortable aspect to this mystery of the resurrection because I brought about his death and I shouldn't have brought about his death. He shouldn't have had to rise from the dead. He should have just come into this world and been accepted as God and accepted as king. And he should have been accepted in all of his miracles and all of his beautiful teaching. And we should have followed him without any trouble. But all abandoned him, including the apostles. All abandoned him. And then he rose. And when he rose, it was a conquering of sin. It was a conquering of death. And so there's something uncomfortable about it. And secondly, St. Peter says, his resurrection is not for all. And here is the mystery of the resurrection. The crucifixion was for all. The resurrection is not for all. Our Lord Jesus Christ died that all men might be saved. He shed enough blood and he suffered enough that every single sin could be wiped out. And every sinner can be saved. But not every sinner is saved. Not every sinner, every sin is wiped out before God, but not every sinner is saved. And many sinners go to the kingdom of hell. And therefore, the resurrection, though the crucifixion touches everyone, the resurrection does not. It doesn't touch everyone. There are some that will never experience any contemplation or any consideration of the resurrection. Because it shall never touch them. It shall never touch their souls. And so, therefore, the resurrection is a great mystery. 
and it's not for all. And St. Peter talks about it in the epistle today when he says that he did not appear to everyone when he rose, but to those to whom he was preordained by God. And we were the witnesses. We ate with him. And we were the witnesses. And why did he rise? That those who would see him after the resurrection should go and preach his word. And without the resurrection, says St. Paul, our faith is in vain. So the resurrection is not for all. It is not for all. And so when we consider this mystery of the resurrection, we also consider that the resurrection is not believed by the apostles. It takes them a long time to believe. These two disciples on the way to Emmaus, they walk all day with Christ. They speak all day with Christ. And we see also another mystery of the consideration of the resurrection is that resurrection can only happen when there is death, which means there can be no resurrection unless there is death. There can be no resurrection unless there is suffering. And it is the will of God that there be certain understandings of our faith. Remember our Lord said, I thank thee that thou hast not revealed thyself to the proud. He thanked the Father. And then to the big ones, but to the little ones. But there are some things that can only be understood after suffering. There are some things that can only be understood when there is pain. And resurrection is one of those things. The greatest of those things. We find, for instance, on the day of the resurrection, the apostles. The holy women go to the tomb. They make the report. The report is made by Cleophas and the other disciple. He says, well, the holy women went to the tomb. Remember, they're walking away from Jerusalem very sad. And they're on the way to Emmaus. What matters is they're leaving Jerusalem. They don't care about Emmaus. And a stranger comes to them. And they forget this stranger. He really is a stranger. And he always remains a stranger. St. Augustine talking about this. Remember, the word Samaritan means stranger. Christ is always a stranger. One thing about a stranger is that we never fully understand him. We never fully understand his language. We never under fully understand his mannerisms. We never fully understand his kingdom. Because his kingdom is truly not of this world. And Christ, therefore, is always a stranger in this world. And he'll never be at home in this world. The home is in heaven. So there they have been with him for three and a half years. They were very familiar with his face. They were very familiar with his teachings. But it says they saw him, but their eyes were held. And they didn't understand. They didn't know that it was Christ. They spoke with him. They heard him say the familiar things that they had heard from him for the last three and a half years. And they still did not understand. Because there are some things that can only be understood when two things have happened. One is suffering. And the second is charity after suffering. Without these two things, there will not be an increase of faith. Not all must experience the cross, says Thomas Akempis. And sacred scripture says the same thing. All experience crosses. No matter how great the fool, no matter how much he hates God, he's going to suffer. All will suffer. But not all will benefit from the suffering not all will be transformed by the suffering, but some will be able to suffer and still understand. Some will be able to suffer and still go to charity. And after they've gone to charity, then they shall see with their eyes the next level of faith. And our Lord wants to give this level to all, but so few make the journey. When we persevere in the time of trial, this is when we're getting close to the resurrection. But many souls do not persevere in the time of trial. The two disciples on the way to Emmaus are very sad. Our Lord asks them, why are you sad? Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Are you the only Samaritan? St. Augustine. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem that doesn't know what has happened? Christ came with great popularity in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday after the resurrection of Lazarus. And then one of his own disciples betrayed him only a few days ago. He crucified and they hung him upon a tree. And he died and was buried. And this is the third day since these horrible things have happened. And this morning some women went to the tomb and they saw that it was empty. And they saw an angel and the angel said he's still alive. Others of us went to the tomb and it was as the women said. But him they did not find. There are many who go to the sepulcher, see all the evidence, but they don't find him. They know with their minds that there were 100 soldiers guarding this tomb. 
The women saw him. The soldiers saw him. The stone was rolled back. He truly rose from the dead. He, he said he was going to rise from the dead. He truly rose from the dead. But him they did not find. And they went looking for him. Others found him. St. Mary Magdalene went looking for him. And she found him. St. John went looking for him and found him. St. Peter went looking for him and found him. But not the others. Because they did not change. They were like the holy women on the way to Jerusalem. When our Lord Jesus Christ is on his way to be crucified. Not the holy women, but the women of Jerusalem. They wept. And our Lord Jesus Christ was disgusted at their weeping. He was not comforted by their weeping. Therefore he turned to them and he said, weep not for me. He did not want to have their cheap weeping. They wept because they felt sorry for them. But they were not sorry for their sins. They were not going to change their lives. They were not going to raise their children followers of Christ. They were not going to change anything in their life. They were going to remain the enemies of Christ until they died. But when they saw him walking by, they wept. And therefore he said to them, weep not for me, but for yourselves and for your children. If you knew that your children in the year 70 A.D., they are going to die a most horrible death in this city at the hand of the Romans. If you knew the death in store for your children and knew the misery in store for you still alive at that time, you wouldn't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. That weeping did not benefit him, but the weeping of Veronica did. The weeping of St. Mary Magdalene did. Everyone visits the cross. Many walk away striking their breasts. But it is a superficial striking for most. And they say indeed he was a son of God. But how many really believe that he's a son of God? Christ does not appear to all those that say he's a son of God. He doesn't appear to all those that came to the crucifixion. Only some. And to those that he appears, he enlightens. And he gives a deep faith. And therefrom that comes the power to convert the world. That's where the apostles got their strength. And from those 12 apostles, including Matthias, from those 12 come the great power of the whole church down the last 2,000 years to convert the world. They were witnesses to these things. Matthias also, he was there somewhere. And he was a witness to these things. And so the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, they consider the history and another key word it tells us in the gospel, and they spoke with themselves, and they reasoned with them, they talked and they reasoned with themselves, says the gospel of St. Luke. This is our problem. It's a good example of what's happening in the blog for the most part today. <laughs> and all the communications about the crisis in the church. They talk and they reason with themselves. Not with Christ. Not with the saints. Not with the spirit of faith. And these are priests. Remember these disciples are priests. They're two of the 72 disciples. They perform miracles. Remember we're reading the gospel as the father, St. Thomas tells them the fathers, the disciples would raise, would perform miracles. They would go and prepare the way for Christ. And they drove out devils. These were priests who had performed miracles. They were there with Christ. They heard his teaching, but they had forgotten. And they began to reason with themselves. They began to reason with themselves. And to talk with themselves. And Christ slowly steps out of the picture. And reasoning with themselves and talking with themselves. They still had a kind of residue of the love of our Lord. They were sad that he was dead. But if they continued to reason with themselves. That sadness would one day go away. And they would be happy that he's dead. They begin with the sadness. As they strike their breasts and walk away from the crucifixion. They begin with the sadness. But they won't end with sadness. And so what happens? They strike. They, they, they are sad and they reason with themselves. The stranger comes. Our Lord Jesus Christ. And he has to tell them another way of looking at the mysteries of the crucifixion. Oh you stulty. You, you foolish and slow of heart. Why don't you understand the prophets? And what does he say? Do you not know that Christ must suffer in order to enter into his glory? We learn in the catechism. Why did God make me? Go who made you? God made me. Why did God make me? To show forth his goodness. That's the first reason. For his own glory. And 
that I might know him, love him, and serve him in this world, and be happy with him in the next. And when I do that, what do I do? I also show forth his glory, because he shows that all is made for his glory. But, his, but the just are made for his glory, and the damned are also made for his glory. The damned shall be the glory of his justice. The just shall be the glory of his mercy. But all is for his glory. And therefore, since Jesus Christ is really God, there's no other reason for him to be crucified than to enter into his glory. And therefore, Christ goes straight to the essence. It was necessary that he suffer. It was necessary that he die, that he enter his glory. And this is what is taught to St. Peter and what is taught to the apostles and why in Acts chapter 5, when they are thrown in prison, when they are persecuted, it tells us exactly what they did. And they rejoiced. Not everybody rejoices when they go to prison. Not everyone rejoices when they're punished. But they rejoiced. These were the same cowards that abandoned Christ on Holy Thursday night. Who locked themselves in the upper room for fear of the Jews. And now only a short time later, just briefly after Pentecost, they are thrown in prison and they rejoiced that they might suffer for the Lord. They were already experiencing the glory of the eighth beatitude. which St. Thomas Aquinas tells us is the perfection and the result and the joy of the seven beatitudes. He says there's only seven beatitudes, like there's seven virtues and seven gifts and so on. But the eighth beatitude, blessed are you when men persecute and revile you for my name's sake. It's the perfection of the seven Beatitudes. And when we see that the apostles are so happy in Acts chapter 5, when they're thrown into prison, it's because they've experienced already. They had to have the sorrow. They had to have the death. They had to have the... the, the, the and then they came after the death to see Christ in the resurrection. And they rejoice because they understand what is the purpose of suffering now. That it is actually for the glory of God. That's one reason why we learn in our little catechism. What are you supposed to do when you get a headache? What are you supposed to do when you have a backache? What are you supposed to do when you have any kind of suffering? Offer it up for the glory of God. Offer it up for the salvation of sinners. And the great saints recognized that suffering was the cause of the greatest joy. And then we turn our eyes back to the crucifix. That is why the apostles never carried a resurrected Christ with them. They carried a cross and they never spoke of just the resurrection except as the seal and the proof of the victory. The glory of Christianity and the glory of Christ was to enter into the suffering that he might experience the glory. The soldiers, when they meet together after the war, what do they discuss? They discuss what they did in the fight, what they did in the battle, the wounds, the experiences when they fought for the king. And so Christ is the greatest of all warriors. And his glory is his suffering. And that's why St. Paul will say, you are my glory and my crown. The suffering that Christ that he experiences is his glory and his crown. And our Lord also says, when Saul of Tarsus has not yet become St. Paul, he explains to Ananias, you must go and baptize him. But he's a bad man. He's a wicked man. He says, no, he's converted now that I knocked him off his horse. And I must teach him what he must suffer for my name's sake. Of all the 13 apostles, suffering is mentioned in sacred scripture only about Saul of Tarsus, who will become St. Paul. And then he will tell us in his writings, he's the greatest of the apostles. And the Holy Ghost tells us that because he has the deepest understanding of pain. Our Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection, he's risen. But not all rejoice. Not all are happy. Those disciples are filled with a slow burning joy. The joy of the resurrection has not come quickly. It requires the agony of Mary Magdalene. It requires the agony of the 11 apostles. It requires the agony of the holy women. It requires this, the closeness to despair of the two disciples that are walking away from Jerusalem. And then our Lord visits them in their pain. And he speaks in their pain. You heard me say these words before. The prophet said Christ must die. The prophet said he will be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Didn't they say that? Yes, they did. Then our Lord said he was going to die and rise on the third day. Yes, he did. This is the third day. The tomb is empty. Why do you not understand? 
and they began to slowly understand. But their understanding is still not complete. And I believe right now, in our present crisis, which is, remember, this resurrection and death has happened many times in the history of the church. But right now, our Lord is testing souls. Who is going to still think of Christ in the pain when Christ seems absent? Who is going to still exercise charity, which is what happens to these disciples? Mane de biscum, Domine, remain with us, O Lord. And he explains why. For it is evening, the day is about finished. Normally, when you have a stranger, this man is a stranger, you don't want the stranger in your house at night. Because that's when the guy is going to rob the place. That's when he's going to slit the throat of everybody in the house. And yet we find the strangers of these disciples. They're with a stranger. And they still think he's a stranger. And he's a really strange man. Because he didn't know anything was going on. Where did he come from? What is in this man? But they say, Mane nebiscum domine. And this is the final test. Remain with us, O Lord. Not knowing that it was Christ. He was going to go on further. He was not going to stay with them. And had they not said money to Biscum, they would never have seen Christ and recognized him in the breaking of the bread. And so our Lord has given a test to us. Who is still going to have the spirit of charity? Because who knows? Remember when our Lord rises from the dead. It may very well be he has already defeated Satan as he did at 3 p.m. on Good Friday. And Satan knew it. But Caiaphas didn't know it. And Peter didn't know it. And the apostles didn't know it, etc. Neither the good nor the evil men in this world knew it. But yet he was defeated and the devil knew it. And he tried to get those apostles to despair on Holy Saturday. But they didn't despair. Those same apostles that 100% followed the devil on Holy Thursday night. After the death of Christ on Good Friday. After they were made the sons of the Blessed Virgin Mary. 100% stayed faithful. And the devil could not get even one. All eleven remained faithful. And he did everything in his power to destroy them. Knowing that they would be the instruments of the destruction of the kingdom of hell. And he knew that Christ would rise. It may be very well right now. The devil has already been defeated by some supernatural act in the church. And maybe right now the devil is anxious to get as many souls as possible to despair. And to go away from the truth. Knowing that he's already defeated. And, the, and meanwhile the good angel is saying. Stay one more night. Walk one more step. Still believe in charity. Credimus in caritate. Was, the, was the, the motto of our founder. This is the time of credimus in caritate. We have believed in charity. If these two disciples did not believe in charity, they would never have seen Christ. They would never have the strength to run back to Jerusalem as they would do in the course of the night. And so they did see Christ. And they did get the strength. Why? Because they said, Mane nobiscum domine. Remain with us, O Lord. Remain with us. And this is the test. It's given to our souls many times in life. We never know the final test. We never know when the Lord's going to give the final test. But one day should be the final test. And we must pass that test. If we pass this one more time, this one more time, this one more time. And so they, the stranger is going to stay in, the, in their house at night. They're going to cook food for the stranger. They don't know if he's safe or he's not safe. But they can't let him go alone in the night. And so who is going to live by this charity in our present battle? After the sorrow, after the wounds, after the confusion... These are the tests that heaven gives us. And these tests are necessary to deepen faith. And that is why not everyone sees Christ risen. All see his cross. All see the evidence of his resurrection. All know he rose from the dead. Caiaphas knew. The soldiers knew. The devil knows most well that he rose from the dead. But does he see him? Some go to find him and they find him not. Because he is not going to appear to everyone. All will see him when he comes as a judge at the end of the world. But not all see the risen Christ. Therefore not all rejoice at this most wonderful feast to the level that they should. And so we must try to have a deeper understanding of the sacred feast of Easter. And these two disciples, they say, Lord, remain with us. Mani nebiscum domine. 
From this, many saints have taken the passage of these two disciples, and many orders of the perpetual adoration were formed on these two words, Mani Nobiscum, remain with us, O Lord. And so, we want our Lord to remain with us, but He will not remain unless we have the spirit of charity. Who has that spirit? We must ask for it. And then, of course, they remain. And these exhausted apostles are given a new strength. Remember, they didn't sleep Holy Thursday night because they were terrified at what had happened with Christ being captured. They didn't think sleep Friday night because of the horror of the crucifixion. They didn't sleep Saturday night because of the horror of Jerusalem. They couldn't bear to sleep in this city. But they had to wait one more night because of the law of the Sabbath. And then on Sunday morning, the first day of the week, they say, let's get out of here. And exhausted and sad, they leave. Now it's Sunday night. And they recognize Christ in the waking, breaking of the bread. What do they do? They don't sleep Sunday night either. They didn't sleep Thursday night. They didn't sleep Friday night. They didn't sleep Saturday night because of sorrow. And Sunday night, they don't sleep because of joy. As they, all, they say that, you know, in the, in, the, in the loser locker room, they're very tired. And John Madden used to say, I've always noticed in the loser locker room, there's a lot more broken arms. There's a lot more busted muscles. There's a lot more strain than in the winning locker room. They were both out there on the battlefield. They were both hitting each other all day. But the winning locker room, they don't have much pain. Losing locker room, everything hurts. When we follow Christ, we're in the winning locker room. And so they weren't exhausted. They were filled with a new life. And they ran back to Jerusalem. They ran back. They walked slowly, depressed away from Jerusalem. And they ran back. And they went and saw the eleven. And they said, indeed, Christ in truth has risen from the dead. We didn't believe it this morning either, just like you didn't. But he truly rose from the dead and he appeared to Simon. And then they said, well, he appeared to us. And not only that, we talked to him the entirety of the day. And recognized him in the breaking of the bread. Another passage referred to many times by the saints. Of course, the holy sacrifice of the mass. That there is some way in which Christ breaks the bread. There's a way in which he moves his hands. You know, each one of us has mannerisms. Everyone has mannerisms. Unique ways of walking. Unique ways of moving their hands. And our Lord Jesus Christ is a real man. He had unique way of talking. He had a unique way of walking. He had a unique and special way that he broke the bread. When he would break the bread and give it to his disciples, they all recognized someone can look like him. Someone can sound like him. But no one can break the bread like him. No one has the mannerisms of him. All day they didn't understand. But then at night, after they said, remain with us, O Lord. And they were sitting at the table. Then they recognized him at the breaking of the bread. And he disappeared from their sight. And they ran back to Jerusalem to testify the truth that they had seen. When we testify the truth, it must not be like the witnesses. Did you see your brother murder this guy? Yes, I did. He's a witness. But we must testify. Testify to the truth because we love the truth. Testify to the truth because we want the truth to be spread. Testify to the truth because of a, of a, a fire of the truth is inside of our bellies. The fire of the truth is not in the belly of, of, of every Catholic, though it should be. The fire of the truth is not there. Because there are levels of our understanding of the truth. And we must get to the level of a supernatural understanding of the truth. And the level is given. And these disciples run back to Jerusalem. And then they spend the night speaking of the wonderful works of God. So says the next verse of the sacred scripture after the mass today. So they spend the night speaking of the wonderful works of God. Which is the history of the church. To spend the night speaking of the wonderful works of God. So in any case, we celebrate this great feast of Easter. Many souls do not rejoice at this great feast. Many because they will never rejoice. Because they will see Christ's justice at the end of the world. But they shall never see his resurrection. They will know about the truth of it, as all know. Everyone knows the truth of it, whether they, they, they say they believe it or not. They know it. But not all will be visited. But God appeared to some that were preordained, says St. Peter, so that they might carry this truth to the world. Witnesses must carry the truth. And we are not witnesses simply because we've seen it. But witnesses because we love the reality of the cross. Witnesses because we love the reality of the, the victory of the cross, which is simply the resurrection, the completion of that victory. But the loving of the cross, that's why those, the apostles immediately carried the cross everywhere they went. 
knowing that this was the victory. If they didn't suffer on Holy Saturday, if they didn't suffer on Good Friday, they wouldn't know the glory of Christ. They wouldn't know the glory of the church. But now they know. And they will spread that glory. And that is why also in the training of priests, the young man goes to the seminary, he spends six years or whatever it is in the seminary, he studies his theology and philosophy, he learns all the things he needs to learn, but then what has to happen? There has to be suffering in the battlefield. And only then can there be the beginning of the sealing of the priesthood. Only then can be the beginning. And this is the way it is with baptism. You're washed, all the sins are wiped away at baptism, but you're not yet sealed. The seal will come in suffering. You get, you, get the, you get the sacrament of confirmation, but you're not yet sealed. The seal will come in suffering, and then in the suffering, we still walk with Christ. In the suffering, we still follow Him, but we don't understand. And we still practice charity, and then one day our Lord enlightens with a sudden enlightenment. While the disciples learned suddenly that He was Christ, they didn't learn suddenly. They had to be with Him three and a half years. They had to weep on Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Thursday night, and Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. They had to have sleepless nights while the rest of the world was resting in comfort. They had sleepless nights while Caiaphas slept like a baby. Caiaphas slept fine because he was happy that Christ was dead, but they could not sleep because they saw the absence of Christ. And in, and after that great agony, which lasted so long, in an instant, Christ took it away by recognizing him with the breaking of the bread. And so it will be with us. If we just persevere in the faith and persevere just one more day, just one more moment. One moment will come when without any warning, heaven will just take away all darkness. Heaven will give us the fullness of light and give us strength that we cannot, cannot be compared to any strength that has been known in this world. It can only be known by the saints. And that strength that's the beginning of true happiness and true and the beginning of heaven and so let's try to understand this great beautiful feast of Easter. Love it with all our hearts. And we'll close that. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.